Welcome to the swing set. Climb on up. There is always a swing available. On Life on the Swing Set, the podcast, we explore ethically non-monogamous relationships, the pleasures and passions, the promise and pitfalls. We discuss all aspects of ethical non-monogamy in a fun, open, and welcoming fashion with a gleam in our eye, a bounce in our step, our hands down your pants. Ooh, sorry, got ahead of myself. We may be biased. In fact, we most certainly are. But we don't sugarcoat, and each of us speaks honestly and earnestly about our thoughts, ideas, and experiences throughout our very own Lives on the Swing set. Thanks for swinging by. We'd like to think the communities we spend time in, spend time cultivating, building, and spending our energy in, are the best communities out there. We enjoy our time, we enjoy our people, we don't want anything to mess up that feeling of near perfection. But no community goes long without problems, and one of the most insidious and most invisible problems in our non-monogamous and kick communities is abuse. People in groups tend to respond poorly when something or someone threatens that perfection, and while we all would like to think that our community members have each other's backs, and that we'll all do the right thing, often we respond the most negatively to victims of that abuse. I'm Dylan, and tonight I have with me... Hey, it's Cooper. And this is Ginger. And we've also invited Peppermint and Ginny Brown to join us for this conversation. Hey, guys. Hello. Hi. Fans, please tweet along with us as you listen to our episode with hashtag SSPodcast. You can also find us all on Twitter at Cooper S. Beckett, Ginger and the Prof, Dylan the Thomas, that Katie Mac, Freak Sexual, and Lyria Lynn. That's L-I-R-E-L-Y-N. Welcome, Pepper. Welcome, Ginny. Thank you. Good to be here. This is a conversation I've actually been trying to have for a long time not necessarily because communities I've been in have been touched by this, even though they have, but the fact that we haven't even talked about this in almost 250 episodes kind of casts its own silence, its own layer, you know, blanket of silence on everything. When it comes down to it, we all know people ha- that have been abused in, in our communities, and we've all had different ways of handling it, both, you know, for us and the way we supported people and the way we've seen people not be supported well. There's a lot of, I I think it's worth deconstructing and figuring out why it happens in the first place. And so I was wondering if you would speak to... Maybe we should talk a little bit about what abuse is. You know, I I think it can be things that are very obvious, like, you know, sexual assault uh, or unwanted touching or stuff like that. Um, But at the same time, I think it can also be things like uh, you know, highly controlling behavior in relationships or harassment on the compu- community or that sort of thing. And, you know, I end up dealing with sort of both sets of things. I would say that, um, uh, you know, they're all physical, sexual, emotional are all terrible. Um, emotional and verbal abuse tend to be the most insidious and the hardest to spot, um, especially as outside observers, because, it can look real, real different from person to person. And there's, you know, there's often not a single concrete or physical thing that you can point to, to say this happened. Um, so it can be, that can be the hardest one to identify. Um, and is just as damaging as the things that are more obvious from the outside. So what makes it so hard to identify when something that happens is actually abuse? That's a good question. Um, I think that we tend to, first of all, we tend to have a sort of black and white mentality. So if we can look at a situation and say, that person was abusive, that person was the victim, usually we say, I prefer to say survivor, but, um, you know, if we're looking at it like that, then, you know, we can say we have a good guy and a bad guy. um, And we can just cut the good guy out, I mean, cut the bad guy out and support the good guy and we don't have to deal with um, complex situations. And it's nice to be able to do that. And sometimes it is that clear cut, but oftentimes it is not. Um, Oftentimes you have multiple parties within a relationship and especially with non-monogamy, when you have so many different relationships potentially happening at once, you can sort of have several people saying, well, this person was abusive to me. And then as a community, you're sort of left saying, well, what do I even do with this? Yeah. We had a situation where we ran a play party and a couple came who'd never been to one of the play parties before and said that uh, her abuser is at this party and gave us a clear, this is the person, and then took themselves out of the situation. 
Meanwhile, we were left with a lot of people who know this person and have vouched for that person. And it really left a, well, what on earth do we do in this situation? It is a hard position. Well, and, you know, I, I want to say something about my own location and all this, which is that I haven't really been on the receiving end of much of this aside from some online harassment. Uh, and so my the reason I'm in this conversation is really, you know, talking about like as I, you know, I'm a community leader, I hold play parties, I'm moderate various poly things in various places. Uh, and so I end up dealing with these kinds of reports. And this is often something that happens, right? Like often it, you don't get a lot of information. Mm -hmm. uh, you sort of have to chase after the information. Like sometime, like in this case, it might have been good to go to the person and say, hey, we heard that this happened. We would really like to know a little bit more um, and on your schedule or whatever. And we promise to keep it all confidential and so on and so forth. And then that gives you a sort of base of information to start with. It's especially hard, I think, in, you know, in Chicago, the poly community has experienced an awful lot of um, detrimental people in positions of power in uh, the various groups. And because it's also an incredibly um, small community of people, everybody knows everybody involved in the situations and everybody is shouting at each other, no, hmm. that person would never do that. Yeah. And when you, you know, for my uh, approach to this is I didn't know one of the people. I knew the other one a little bit. And I was getting very different, dramatically different information from uh, both sides. And it really felt like, okay, now I, it's, it's my job now to be the arbiter. <laughs> and I, I didn't. You know, it was it was one of the few times that I have ever just completely not known how to deal with a situation as a community leader. And ultimately, it was um, the fact that the the person, the victim, uh, the the survivor, pulled herself out of the situation. Mm -hmm. So it made. It made it a, a detente for the moment, but it still became a discussion that uh, my co-host and I had to have a serious discussion about that other person because that other person was part of her network. And, you know, it's, it's difficult. Yeah, it is. It's, it's really difficult to, um, to know how to deal with, um, a situation like that when you don't know all the facts and you don't know right. um, who is being honest or who is coming from a um, very unique perspective on a situation. Um, and, you know, you don't have an entire investigative team at your disposal <laughs> to really right. weigh everything that's going on. Um, uh, though, let me say, um, there's this thing that you run into on the Internet that's like believe survivors, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in general, I've found that to act, actually really, really be true. Like I've dealt with maybe 40 to 50 situations of various sorts on various levels. And I've yet to find one where the person reporting to me was just straight up wrong or lying. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And I, yeah. I, didn't, uh, I didn't doubt her in any way. My, my uh, I guess it was more of a, well, what, what would you like to see be done you know i i guess it, on some level if we've agreed to host events or uh be in leadership in communities uh or plan events or something but at some point we've signed on to a larger responsibility to to handle issues between people and we, we, but we didn't really sign up to be the arbiters of justice and pass judgment on people right but no matter what this is the kind of thing where we two people can't exist. You know, an, an abuser and somebody that's abused can't exist in the same community and in the same spaces. So at some point, you're going to have to make some sort of choice. I think we aren't really prepared. I'm not prepared. I, I've had to deal with this before, but I'm not always prepared to deal with it in the moment. If uh, 
you know, Cooper, like you said, you had the person that let you know that the abuser was there bow out of the situation. And I mean, you didn't have to deal with it right away, but you still have to deal with it eventually. Yeah, if you I, have, yeah. Yeah, if you have two people attending the same event and then all of a sudden one person comes to you and say, I can't be here because of that person, you still want them included. You don't want them left out of an event because their abuser's there. Absolutely. But, uh, taking an abuser aside and telling them that they're not welcome also causes a scene and you know it can potentially blow up the event that that you have there and so what i did do in the situation is first of all i kept a very alert eye on the other person you know the, that was that was sort of my focus for the rest of the night then afterwards i asked for far more information about the situation because I got very little, and it was like moments before the party was about to do the welcome circle. And then ultimately, neither of them were coming to those parties uh, anymore. And that was that's a shitty solution, but it solved it momentarily. I think the the longer term solution is dealing with dealing with it from the perspective that you never want an abuser in your community, right? And so somebody's somebody's mentioned that something's happened and you're going to have to deal with the person that did that thing but uh, i'm actually curious how everybody here has dealt with people that way because i've i person to person like if i have somebody in front of me i'm comfortable confronting them because i can control the situation uh i'm i'm a big enough guy and a strong enough guy that i don't fear for my own safety or anybody else's safety if I'm confronting somebody. But often reacting to these things isn't something that can happen right away, and there are a lot of ancillary events that happen. So when you, when dealing with somebody that you're trying to get out of a community or that you're trying to make sure they don't attend certain types of events, uh, how, do you, how do you control everything surrounding that so that it doesn't result in uh, communities tearing themselves apart, for example? Um, you know, I just w I want to say that from my history, that's pretty rare. And maybe that's because I'm coming from San Francisco and like we have huge communities and our communities don't tear themselves apart based on like one or two people generally. Um, but I, you know, have yet to get much in the way of blowback. And and let me tell you, you can say this really easy thing, <laughs> right? Like, oh, I removed this person. Oh, why did you remove this person? Oh, I got reports that they were grabbing people's asses without asking first and it happened multiple times and I talked to them and they expressed no remorse and that was that, right? Like yeah, that's unassailable. No one is going to like get upset with you for that kind of decision. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, I've, I've seen situations and I've heard of situations in other cities, especially where, um, uh, you know, like there did end up being some, a lot of like, Oh, I want to call it like social gerrymandering or something <laughs> like that, right? Like where, <laughs> <That's great. laughs> you know, like people, you know, the person, often if the person is very charismatic and if they're abusive in relationships, which is a unfortunate common combination, right? Like they'll line up a bunch of partners and uh, social uh, people, social contacts on their side and so on and so forth. And you get these sort of like, you know, it seems in smaller communities, you especially get these uh, things where the community splits. But uh, I haven't had any to deal with that personally. Uh, Jenny, have you seen any of that? Um, yeah, what I have seen mostly has been um, sort of uh, lots of verbal attacks, lots of social media um, saying both these people and this organization do not handle abuse right. This is the abuser speaking um, and saying that, you know, these people have handled things horribly and usually writing very long diatribes about, you know, all the reasons, um, and generally trying to sling as much mud on the, on the community and the scene and the people that, um, they perceive to have hurt them as possible, um, which is a, you know, understandable reaction from their point of view because they've just been cast out and they're real mad about it. Um, so it's, it's a very, um, I don't, I feel like, a sort of a physical response is less common in my experience and the, um, let me do everything I can. And the, and the people I know that do this are tend to be tapped into like social justice and consent positive communities. So they will bring in some of that language, um, in their attacks. 
which then, you know, has the potential to confuse people because um, you say, well, wait a minute, what's what's really happening here? Isn't it the most dangerous person that has a very, very strong grasp of like 95 percent of the high quality tenets of a group and then just is morally bankrupt on the last five? You know, Dylan and I have been fighting crusades uh, to use a interesting word for me against uh Guys who are really pushing the no sex positive community. We all got to stand together. I'm just trying to, you know, and it's like he, he knows all the buzzwords. He knows all the mechanics. He can get right there in people's faces and then just spew bile everywhere. Yes. And, and that's an important thing. Like, you know. Well, some of the situations I've dealt with have been really simple, right? Like someone did something at a play party. I talked to them. They were clearly lying to me. I threw them out, right? Sometimes it's simple. Mm -hmm. But especially when you get folks in poly community or who are like really built into a social scene or who are defending their membership in some kind of organization or something like that, it is always a clusterfuck, right? And I've just come to expect it. Yeah. Yeah. A clusterfuck. And by clusterfuck, I mean, you know, Clearly, there's lying going on. There's things coming at me from all directions. Uh, there's a huge wall of FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt that's thrown up. And in some ways, I, I personally, when I'm handling stuff, uh, just use that to judge the situation, right? Like if I start talking to someone and they're like, you know, derailing and obfuscating and being like, well, yes, but no, and all this stuff. Mm -hmm then that's the sort of person that's a yeah that's a pretty good barometer that it, right that it's probably kind of manipulative whereas if they're like oh i yeah that happened and i feel really bad about it and it was really unfortunate and you know is there some amends i can make then i'm like oh hi yeah you know maybe you know you're a more positive person here and there's some way to resolve this and i think in those cases it's super important that the amends are actually made yes like, I tend to judge these things by what happens in action. Sure. Because people love to talk. And especially, like, really charismatic, manipulative types love to talk <laughs> because that's where they're in their power, right? Yep. Uh, but when you when you say, okay, I need you to, like, withdraw from this event or I need you to, like, not teach that workshop or something like that, and then all of a sudden everything is different, then you're like, okay, you weren't serious. There's talk about things like restorative justice and um, sort of maintaining relationships with abusive people to hold them accountable. And that I think there's a lot of good stuff there. But I also see a lot of people say that's what they're going to do. And then there's no actual accountability there. Um, it's just sort of a way to not make ripples. Um, and I think the the actual accountability needs there of number one, respect the survivor and what they need whether that's no contact or, you know, any number of other things. And number two, what steps are you going to take to show us all that you are learning and changing from what happened? I, I think the question of what do you need is really important. And, and, and I, I focus on it because I don't think I, I wouldn't have thought to ask that um, until more recently. Like I I've, I'm hearing you, I hear what you say, uh, but Asking what they need is, it shouldn't be a foreign idea, but it feels like a foreign idea because it's just not something I've, I've thought of doing before. But, uh, to, you know, even if that person says, I need that person removed here, um, I, I think that depending on the kind of situation that's there, there can be uh, ways to address that with the person who committed those acts directly. Uh, to, to kind of feel that I know I know we kind of talked about it a little bit but not every situation has to be uh, a situation where that person gets kicked out unless that's what the person that's been abused specifically says that that they need like if if, if you know it, any future restorative actions really depend on whether that person's interested in receiving that apology set or that uh, you know, making up for what happened if if they're not interested in seeing that happen then it seems like it kind of shuts the door on that and and i'm okay with that like i would rather uh i would rather be blamed for kicking somebody out of a group a little bit too easily than potentially put somebody else or 
the person that's been abused in a situation where they're going to be abused again. Uh, at least as a community leader, that's the way that I feel about it. But I, I put like I personally, if I'm going to put myself in a leadership position, I would go the extra miles, and if there is a potential path forward to rehabilitating somebody, you know, I'm okay with taking that on. But what about regular members in a community? You know, what what do we expect them to do when they hear something? That's a good question. Because, <laughs> like, you know, I've taken it upon myself to lead the group, and, you know, that, that that's on me. But what uh, I, I can talk about what I expect people to do uh, all I want. And at the end of the day, I want people to go ahead and refer things to me. Well, and, and here's the thing. You know, like, what I've found is that survivors and other people in the community are actually highly forgiving, generally. And... Like, and, and yet there there keep being these situations where there's forgive you know it, forgiveness is the wrong word but like willing to look past it willing to work with the person, but typically I see that fail and that's because the person who's causing the problem tends to go on and just keep causing the problem with other people yeah. or they aren't accountable for the problem they've caused and which sort of makes sense like the sort of person who might cause the problem in the first place is the sort of person who might not care later that they've done so. Um, but yeah, like, I mean, people talk about restorative justice a lot and I've seen it work like once or twice. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, you know, there was a guy in our local community who had a thing about, you know, pressuring women not to use condoms that where he just recently, uh, you know, the, everyone set it up and all this and he just like failed to show up or do it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I guess I expect people in the community to make their own judgments and stuff. I just like to try to give them information when possible. Well, it's it's funny that, um, I mean, I see this uh, a lot in the sex positive community is that <clears throat> it's it's a specific kind of person that is creating sort of a systemic abuse pattern throughout the community. And there's enough people defending them that it keeps the people who have been abused from actually talking about it. And we, you know, I've, I've been involved in a few of these situations where we have a number of people talking behind the scenes about how this thing happened. Oh yeah, that happened to me. Oh yeah, that happened to me. And then when people start talking publicly on Facebook, on Twitter, they get shouted down by friends of the abuser. Yeah, usually and, pretty in aggressively. Yeah. And it's it's funny because, you know, you see it happening both as uh, sexual abuse, as emotional abuse, even even like career abuse you know we work in a community where a lot of people donate their time and so it's very easy to get under each other's skin like that and especially if you're at all in a position of power or power to hold career advancement or prestige over people it's it's really really easy to convince people that their feelings of abuse are wrong and they are the problem. Especially since uh, a side effect of most kinds of abuse is to really undercut your own self-confidence yeah. and self-esteem. So you're already sort of vulnerable to having other people convince you, oh, no, your feelings don't matter. Your perceptions are wrong. Uh, you just have to sit there and take whatever is dished out. It makes it extra hard to deal with it in a sort of community situation because you're already so undermined. I'm going to take us to a break, but when we come back, I kind of want to bring it to a place where we discuss how to, if somebody's being undermined, what people can do to make sure that they aren't, uh, what you what people can do to kind of deflect some of that attention and what you can do to support people. So we'll be right back with Life on the Swings of the podcast. Two thousand sixteen is moving fast, and we're getting ever closer to being back in paradise at Desire Resort and Spa in Cancun, Mexico. Two thousand sixteen's trip is from November fifth through twelfth. 
Desire is probably my favorite spot in the whole world. A sex-positive and open place that lets us hang out, get our sexy freak on, whatever form that may take, be it swinger, poly, nudist, or simply curious. Eat, drink, enjoy like the gods of hedonism that we are. For our fifth year, we're taking over the entire resort, and that allows us full control over the entertainment and themes. We're already over half booked, and it's a small resort, so these rooms are going to go fast. We've had a waiting list every year. You don't want to miss your chance. Go to ssdesire.com for more information, to listen to our past podcasts, and read blog posts from previous trips. I can't wait to be back in paradise with you all. ssdesire.com. Choose your own adventure. When it comes to online dating, we here at The Swing Set believe that Cassidy is the best one out there. It looks great, it's intuitive and easy to use, and it's simply full of potential sexy friends. Still the fastest growing online swinger dating site in the world, Cassidy has been our go-to site for the last three years. If you sign up using our link at lifeontheswingset.com slash K-A-S-I-D-I-E, you'll get some free time to explore the site. And you can decide for yourself if Cassidy is the site for you. Hope to see you there at Cassidy.com. So welcome back to Life on the Swings of the Podcast. We're discussing abuse and non-monogamous in gay communities. I interrupted you earlier, Ginger, and I'd like to uninterrupt you right now. That's okay. <laughs> I'm going to walk back the interruption. <laughs> That's priceless. That's priceless. Well, thank you, Dylan. And I, you know, all, all amazing points all around. And I'm grateful for the brain trust that we have here in both Pepper and Ginny in terms of experiences and ability to step back and, and see things from a particular vantage. And just before break, we were talking about the place from which survivors come when you are stepping up into disclosing experiences you had and the idea of coming from a deficit. And although I do believe that for some people that deficit of emotional resources comes from a place of, you know, vulnerability in the sense that you may be talked into things or you may be at a place where, um, different members of the community could have sway over you. I really feel like there is, a different model in terms of a survivor coming from a place of you've already utilized so many resources moving through the experience of abuse first and foremost. And then you have to do the emotional mental triage of deciding whether speaking up is even going to get you a result. Mm -hmm. And you have to be able to trust the people around you to understand that piece of the puzzle that you've already had to overcome an experience of resource deficit, emotional resource deficit to even speak up. So then therefore to continue with the ability to endure the onslaught of an abuser's posse, if you will, almost sometimes wouldn't be worth it. So the idea of bowing out of play parties, of finding a new community, it's actually a better option. It actually feels more worthy of your time unless you're willing to take an activist bent and you're willing to say, you know what, I'm going to swallow all of my own cost here and step up into the place of saying, you know, this is bigger than me. And I'm willing to do it for more than just me and step up into the place of making yourself someone to be looked at and observed and picked apart and seen as a person who may have faults that drew you into that position and, and, and. I mean, we all know what the world does with sexual assault victims or abuse victims of all types. And I feel like there's a part of our community that can recognize 
and, and I guess Dylan, this tips over into your it, wants and desires for this part of the podcast, that there's a part of our community that really needs to recognize that we're used to and more adept at listening to and, and diving into this restorative justice than we are listening to the needs of survivors seeing what they need, providing that because of our own discomfort. Mm -hmm. We're we're willing to step up into, oh, this person violated the rules. They violated the norms and mores of our community. So it feels more comfortable to, to encounter them and to hold them accountable than it actually does to go into a compassionate, generous, loving place with a survivor. And that's, that's a tough thing for our community to really acknowledge that sure it's a, it's, I don't want to say it's the easy path, but it, it's a path that makes a lot of sense to encounter someone who's an alleged abuser and have these conversations with them about their abuse of power, it's a whole different ball of wax to go to someone who is in a place of feeling having, having been violated and to meet their needs. And that's just something I think is important for our community to be, to be face forward about. That's a really good point. When I think especially our community has a lot of people who still feel very intense shame about the things they're interested in doing. And when an abusive force hits that portion of their life that they feel shame about, it's that much more difficult to stand up for yourself, to even talk about it, because it may replay all those scripts that have been running in your head saying, well, maybe, maybe this is what you get for joining this community. I know I have felt that shame and I, I blame my Catholic upbringing for that <laughs> because <laughs> you easily can regress into a, Oh yeah, this is why I shouldn't have done this. Yep. You know? And it also, that aspect of things undermines um, the support that you, the amount of available support you have outside um, yeah. Oh, you know, I was amused by I was abused by my poly or my swinging or my kink partner. There are fewer people you can go to for sympathy. You sort of need to be able to look within the community for support. Um, and if Absolutely. you're not getting it there, you might have nowhere else to go for the just emotional support and healing because of the stigma that comes in from outside. And legal support. <laughs> And I feel like that's especially true for, you know, like kink communities and uh, play party communities and stuff like that, where, you know, people have this people on the outside have this real attitude of like, well, what did you expect? Yep. You know, what were you what was going to happen? Right. Which really puts the onus on us to police our community because nobody else is going to do it for us. Well, and certainly to your point, Jenny, as well, and, and Pepper as well, that, you know, from the outside, if you you know, I'm assuming all of us who are swing open poly kinkster types have friends who don't engage in those kinds of, of life experiences. And to them, just by nature of what we might do in the kink community, that looks like abuse in and of itself. And so having to draw that distinction for someone having to, you know, like I always say, coming out's not really about you. <laughs> coming out is about someone else handing you their baggage when you come out to them. <laughs> and so I feel like there's an element of that where if you were to seek that healing from and, and support from someone who's not well versed in the community, you have to do a first do a whole education peace with them yeah. so they understand where you're coming from first and foremost, so they can then be in a compassionate place with you in terms of feeling like, oh yeah, you are a quote unquote legitimate survivor. You, you may have been abused, even though part of your relationship with this person was to be tied up and flogged or to be humiliated or, or, or. And so there's a lot there that is a, there's a lot of complexity that ha that can happen all at the same time around an experience that then 
as I shared earlier, really robs you of those emotional resources you need to even have those conversations. And so that's a, that's a huge challenge. And, and so if we're not showing up in the sex positive community to respond to survivors in a compassionate understanding way, then then there's not many other places that those folks can turn to get the healing and understanding and processing and, and justice, if I can use that word, that, that they need in, in order to feel whole again. And, you know, there's also an element too that occurs that when you do access friends who are outside of the community, you know, the idea of, well, they already might think things are suspect as, as we've been talking about. So this, this reticence to, to say, oh, this happened in my world that I've been telling you is so safe and secure and consent based (laughs) and, and all of these things. And here I am coming to you with, and I've been victimized and consider myself a survivor of abuse by a person who lives in this world that I've been telling you is my safe haven and my healing place. And that can really be a huge, uh, just, just, you know, all all I can come up with is just a huge mind fuck. Like that is a lot to handle when you are in a space of trying to deal with your own idea of what it means to be a survivor and what it means to continue in the community that means so much to you. And so there, there's just a lot of complexity there. And that's a tall order to ask of someone who is still reeling from the trauma of abuse of some sort. I I guess that's, that's kind of the problem with being the, the token person, right? If, you're the the token person of color in the room. Often you end up explaining to all your white friends uh, what the person of color experience is. If you happen to be the token transgender person in the room, you end up answering a lot of questions from uh, people that don't understand the experience. And not everybody that happens to be different wants to always be on explaining those things. And when you end up being a victim and choosing to be a survivor, and you end up having to explain just to get support from people that aren't in the community or even people that are in the community. You end up having to explain why you opted in to certain things when you joined that community, but that it didn't mean you opted into the abuse that you got. Uh, And people don't understand that. And that can cause it. it, it, You, you end up being that token victim to a lot of your friends and family when, like you said earlier, Jen, it just saps more energy that you could be spending dealing with what happened as opposed to reaching out to get support. It's, it's a real high hump to, uh, to work through, to get there. And not everybody wants that, right? Uh, Not everybody wants to be that token person. Right. Um, Right. And so for, for people that don't want to become the activist or don't want to be that token person and have to explain everything, uh, what can people that already understand them or at least are, trying to support them what what can they do to support them and help protect them when they're being confronted or harassed or excluded or shunned without necessarily fanning the flame and drawing more attention to that person who already wants to shut out the world at least for now and focus inward i think the for me the first and most important thing you can do is to believe them and tell them that um, because there's almost always an aspect of mind fuckery and the abusive person saying, well, none of what I did to you was really abuse. It was really that bad. And there's so much self doubt. Um, and it can, you know, it can last for months or years after the actual abuse has ended this like endless hashing over. Was it real? Am I just being crazy? What's happening? So if you are in a position to say, yeah, what happened to you was terrible. I believe you. I believe your story. Um, to let them know very explicitly, um, that you believe them because uh, like on a very one-to-one personal level, um, cause that can be so validating and let them know that you have, um, that they have an ally in you, that they have someone who will not immediately turn on them and start talking about how terrible they are instead. 
And along with that, Jenny, I would say the idea of it's okay as a person responding to a survivor to not know what to do. Mm -hmm. Let them take the lead. Let them reclaim their power and say, I'm here for you. I have no clue what I can do for you right now, but I'll do what I can. Yep. And being able to be in a space of approaching someone and allowing your own vulnerability that, yes, it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for everyone. And so being able to be in that discomfort and vulnerability yourself in approaching a survivor and just being an open, an op- open arms, open heart and someone who's willing to be their ally and support in private and public ways. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, there's nothing required of you other than being willing to do what you're, what you're being asked to do. And so you don't need to go in with the answers. Yeah. In fact, you don't it's need better to that go you in don't, with the answers. Usually. Indeed. Indeed. The last thing you really want is some, is another person trying to tell you how you should be living your life. And well, why didn't you do this? And you know, I think this is, should be your next step. And like people that can, yeah, let you take the reins and just be as a quiet ally, um, is really, really vital. The quiet ally. I, uh, that, that works in a lot of different ways. I hadn't even thought about that. Yeah. I tend to think of it as survivor led. Um, you know, I feel like all these processes that happen within the community should be as I think of it survivor led, right? Like the the person who's coming in with the report or has had the experience needs to be the one leading what actually happens. And I you know, and I want to say this to any community organizers out there who might be listening, right? Like this is one of the most crucial things I do when I'm responding to a person, which is I say, what would you like to happen? You know, if I want if I want to do something, I say, would this be okay with you? Um, because sometimes it is, and sometimes it's not. Yet one thing I see is there's a whole lot of fear of reprisals, like mm-hmm. super, super bad. So it's so important to keep confidentiality, at which you know can put me in a weird situation, right? Like often I'm like, well, I'm throwing you out of the party. Why are you throwing me out of the party? Well, you did some things that were non-consensual. Who did I do them to? I'm not going to tell you that, right? And like really having this, you know, operating in a situation where I don't have a lot of information and certainly I'm not going to share any information. Um, but confidentiality is so important. And when I've screwed that up in the past, it's been really, it's been really <laughs> bad. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, definitely because some people will want there to be some publicity. Um, some people will want to know, um, you know, well, I, I want everybody to know so that the community can be protected uh, and sometimes people just want it to, you know, be dealt with as, as under the rug as possible, um, just so that they don't have to go through more trauma. Um, so yeah, absolutely listening to the survivor and what they want in their situation is sort of step one. I guess, that, you know, something that I've, I've thought about is when something like this happens, uh, even if everybody isn't necessarily going public or blowing up, there's always... There's always talk. There's always chatter in the background of what may or may not have happened. And in the midst of that, even if somebody isn't necessarily trying to destroy somebody else, just discussion of what happened can end up putting the wrong idea out there. Mm-hmm. And so when when a victim, when a survivor ends up rejoining the community, all of a sudden, what, what do you do about whispers? <laughs> you know, if somebody doesn't necessarily want to make things public, but they're already being judged based on information that, you know, everybody's clearly, everybody involved is clearly decided is, uh, is wrong. Um, and you know, it, it'd be, it'd be, there's privacy there. You want to respect privacy, but at the same time you want to un- make people understand, Hey, this person isn't the bad guy here and we're welcoming them back in because they were the victim. One thing you can say if, you know, if you're in a position to actually confront that, one thing you can say is, you know, there are elements to this story that you all don't know about, which is almost always true. Um, 
and reminds people that all of the, all of what they've built up in their heads is not based on the full picture. Um, so that's one that I feel like is good to fall back on is, you know, you're not, you're not talking about all of, you're not talking about the full story here because you don't have it and you're not going to get it because it's private. Yeah. And I think there, I think there's some difficulty in being in that space of being like, there's more going on and I'm not going to tell it to you, but I'd ask you to not judge based on what you think, you know, right. But I find myself saying that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> you want to, you want to call to the adults and people the, you know, Oh, okay. We can be grown up about this and not be high schoolers. Um, though I do want to put out a good word in favor of the gossip network when it is working for survivors and against people who have been predatory or whatever. Um, I feel like it's one of the primary ways that people protect themselves in our community is by sort of these like rumors that pass around. And in, and in some cases, that's how reports start, right? Like I'll hear something from someone like, oh, did you hear about blah, blah, blah? And I'm like, no. And they're like, and it's very vague and I don't get a lot of information. And a week later, I hear from someone else and so on and so forth. Um, you know, we don't have police. We don't have much in the way of, you know, there's no poly regulatory board in my city that can throw people out, right? Like there's no, um, we have community leaders, but they're only so effective. Uh, and so the way people protect themselves is checking up on folks and talking about things that happen and stuff like that. And I want to just say that it's important to honor that. You know, I hear people say things like, oh, well, you shouldn't be gossiping or that's just a rumor or uh, why is this person starting drama? <laughs> right. And it's because, well, actually, there's a thing happening. Yeah. And the thing happening often shows up in whispers before it shows up in shouting. You know, by the time it comes to to me, a community leader, often there's like, you know, four or five people involved in a clear pattern and so on and so forth. But before that, there's other things going on. I think people protect themselves by sharing and by hearing other people sharing. Yeah, I think what I encourage people to ask themselves and whoever they are talking to in these whispers is what is the purpose of this conversation? Is this about... Um, you telling me an experience you had because you need emotional support for it? Is this about you warning me about somebody in the community? Or is this just you enjoying an exciting, juicy story that doesn't necessarily have to do with either of us? What is the purpose of this conversation we're having? Right. Or potentially actually trying to malign people. Yeah. And that's really a thing that I've seen happen when someone is predatory or abusive or what have you uh, in a relationship or outside of it. Uh, often part of the FUD that they will throw down is a lot of sort of maligning gossip. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the thing about the gossip network, though, is it often uncovers other people who have been abused. Yep. Because they're far more comfortable standing up and saying, oh, yeah, that person abused me, too, when it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation than if it's a, a public accusation, a public demonstration of you are no longer invited to these parties, the, even even if someone else has been abused, they may not feel comfortable standing up and adding their name to the stack because it's already happening. So we won't have an idea of the full extent of the abuse. And one of the one of the things that the I think the gossip network can be very good about is if enough people talk to enough people, it, will you have something tumble out like the Bill Cosby House of Cards? And it's it's each of the voices get a little bit louder because they are connecting with the other voices. And when um, me as a community uh, leader hears about stuff, I I listen to what they want and I encourage them to talk to other survivors. And if I know two survivors of the same person, you put them together. Yeah. Because then that begets more, we get more, begets more. And then suddenly everybody's talking and it can no longer be ignored by the abusive party. We'll tell you what, let me, let me bring us to a commercial. And uh, when we come back, we'll kind of close the loop on all this. So we'll be right back with Life on the Swings at the podcast. We 
all come to a point in our lives when we finally ask the ever-looming question, is this all there is? And most of us coast along afterwards, just accepting that the answer to that question is probably, yeah, this is it. Sometimes though, we're lucky. Sometimes we run into the right people at the right time. The young couple at the center of a life less monogamous, the new novel by Cooper S. Beckett, are about to meet a couple of swingers, and this moment will change their lives. Cooper's first novel is already receiving acclaim, and you can pick it up today direct from the author at alifelessmonogamous.com as a signed paperback, DRM-free ebook, or pre-order the audiobook and save 50%. Use promo code SWINGSET at checkout to save 10%. You can also get Cooper's memoir, My Life on the Swing Set, Adventures in Swinging and Polyamory, as an ebook, signed paperback, or audiobook at mylifeontheswingset.com. Enjoy more Cooper today in book form. We at The Swing Set believe that being risk-aware and practicing safer sex makes our lifestyle exponentially better. With that in mind, we're partnering with Lucky Bloke, global condom experts, and the best online source for condoms and lube to say no to mediocre condoms and bring the most pleasurable, safer sex directly to our listeners. Go to swingsetcondoms.com to see a specially curated selection of condoms, lubes, and assortments to reintroduce variety and excitement into the protection portion of your playtime. You should especially take note of the deluxe sampler put together by us at the Swing Set for your party and date night kit. Making your condom purchase here supports both us at the Swing Set and the wonderful purveyors of safer sex, the lucky bloke. Swingsetcondoms.com Welcome back to Life on the Swing Set, the podcast. We're discussing abuse in non-monogamous and kink communities. And something that I kind of mentioned early on that we haven't touched on yet is that sometimes when we hear about these things happening, uh, people can react badly because they want to kind of protect the peace and protect the the community, but they do it in in poor ways and they end up getting protected by attacking victims. As somebody in a community that sees that happening, uh, I'm curious what you can do to kind of diffuse that and change the narrative around uh, something that's happened uh, so that you can actually address, you know, the actual problems. I would say, um, yeah, it's it's certainly an understandable impulse to want to defend your community and say, oh, no, that kind of thing doesn't happen here. Shh, stop talking about it. Um, but But to point out, all right, but uh, actually abusive and predatory people exist in every community, in every religious community and special interest group. Like they are everywhere. And if we are going to survive as a community, we have to address it and we have to protect the um, people that they are preying on um, and not give them a safe haven, not give the, um, the abusive people a safe haven in our community or it will destroy it. Um, and then to, you know, go over the, all the talking points of this is how that's different. This is how what this person did is different from the, what we normally practice. And these are the differences between abuse and kink. And these are the differences between emotional abuse and non-monogamy. And um, all those, you know, we can remind our own people. They're not, it's not the same thing. You've given these talking points. You know it's not the same thing. Um, and if you give in to that impulse to close ranks and protect the people you see as your own, you are going to destroy our community from the inside. Um, and I think the word destroy is really important in what you just said. I just want to cut in and say, right, like, you know, and I, it, there's this sort of false set of priorities going on, right? It's more important to protect the community by staying quiet than it is to what? I'm not saying this well, but anyways, right, if you don't, if the community does not end up being a safe place, if you don't handle abusive people, the community is in fact destroyed. It will go away. I've seen it happen. Um, as, and so then at that point, there's nothing to protect from, you know, I don't know, the gossip mongering of the media or whatever, a bad media representation. So I think people get overly concerned about what's coming in from the outside and they should be more concerned about what's going on inside. There can also be this crushing sense of, wow, I thought we were doing better than that. Wow, I thought 
my community was safe, not the macro community, the micro community. You know, Dylan and I just did a, an episode where we dealt with a person in our actual community who suddenly blew up and it's just like, well, Jesus, I thought we were a, a little bit better. I thought our screening was better. I thought our network was better. And that's – then then you, uh, I question, well, okay, so is is my ability – to create safe space is that the problem that i am unable to create safe space or is it that there is just this en endemic thing across all types of communities but especially slightly marginalized communities that allow narcissists and sociopaths and even the micro monsters to thrive well you know i want to break that down a little bit and say you know abuse is in some ways just the exercise of power in a bad way and i don't think well i i would love to imagine a world where it is not happening in any of our communities but we're not close to that world um and so i think it should just be expected and leaders shouldn't beat themselves up about it but that's important that it should be expected right there should be things in place already, <laughs> you know, uh, like when I've started play party groups, like up front, I'm with the, with the other organizers. I'm like, we need to be able to throw people out. If we don't do it, can't do that. I can't be here. You know, if we, if we can't take a good social justice attitude on what's going on here, then I really don't want to try because our situation is just going to get more and more poisoned, um, as we don't deal with stuff. And I guess I want to break down, you know, we've been talking a lot in this conversation about, you know, abusive people as one class and sort of everyone else as another class. But I, I think it's not so simple. I think most of us have done fucked up things at one point in our lives, perhaps. Um, and it's easy to fall into a lot of these things and people do it because they're depressed or whatever. Um, and so, you know, there's this sort of change starts at home thing. And specifically, you know, in, in the best case, in our communities, there will be sort of an ongoing dialogue and practice of people looking inside themselves and inside other people around control, abuse, sexual assault, things like that, and trying to really be better themselves and help the people around them be better, though in some cases, that's by removing them from the community. Yeah, I think that's a great point, and that one of the ways that we can really facilitate that is by talking about it openly and talking about it as something that, yes, it's not just in that community over there. It is likely to be here, if not today, then maybe next week. Or, um, and, and yeah, uh, I don't want to say normalizing abuse because that doesn't sound right, but um, normalizing the experience of it and the fact that it happens and saying this is a thing that we as a community can cope with this is the thing that we as individuals can look at and look at within ourselves for those um, controlling and manipulative uh, dynamics. And let's let's talk about it instead of always trying to hide it in a corner as quickly as possible. Normalizing the discussion, making a, a space where you can have that kind of discussion, a normal thing, uh, is something that, that feels right. And I think that goes a long way towards helping um, everybody in the community be aware of and attuned to the possibilities um, and, um, and, and giving them the tools they need to respond when it does happen, to respond in helpful ways. Uh, and this is an important thing for leaders to be out in front of as well, right? You know, for your events, have anti-harassment, anti-sexual assault or pro-consent, uh, you know, anti-abuse policies and talk with people before events and hold workshops on this stuff and people go to these workshops um you know like i feel like there's a lot more space for leadership of and, and you know i'm using leadership vaguely we could all be leaders um but the people who are holding things to um, be active in this and there's this other thing that happens where if you're public if it's clear that you're publicly on the side of survivors uh, people are more likely to come to you. Absolutely. If you're having trouble at your event. 
Uh, and that's definitely a thing that's happened to me. The more I've gotten a reputation for handling these situations well, the more of them come to me in the situations of power that I have, uh, to the point where I'm almost always dealing with at least one these days, which sort of tells you how many, how much of it's going on, right? Yep. Yeah, because as um, Ginger talked about, there's that calculus that goes on in your head when you're a survivor. Is it worth the risk? Um, and one of the things you will definitely look at if you're t- thinking about going to leaders is their track record and what you've seen about them before. Right. And this is part of why it's super important to come down on the side of survivors, um, you know, not just if you're a leader, but if you're a community member or an activist or educator of any sort or just a friend. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I have found being out as a survivor in my community that there are, you know, people that I barely know will message me and say, hey, this thing is happening in my relationship. Can I talk to you about it? Um, Because it's really important to have safe people to talk to. And if you are open about either what you've experienced or about your sort of no tolerance policy, you become that safe person. And that's really important for people to have. Uh, There's. There's another thing that community organizers can do that I just want to touch on briefly because we haven't said it. And it's something we do pretty well here in San Francisco, which is it's so important for community organizers, especially in large fractured communities like we have here. It's so important for them to talk to each other. We've got a pretty good system here where a lot of us trust each other. And so, you know, it really happens like someone does something in one event in one community and the rest of us hear about it. And, you know, I would love to say that it was more public, but it's not. We sort of haven't reached that point in these communities yet where we can publicly talk about names and what's happened, which is unfortunate. But uh, definitely organizers gossip and organizers should gossip. Gossip is the wrong word. Compare notes, you know? Yeah. Uh, And we've been very successful at closing certain people out of our communities. Um, You know, often we talk to them, we give them a chance and rarely do they take that chance and then they're gone. Right. I've noticed that not only rarely do they take that chance, but immediately after they double down on it, exactly what it was <laughs> right, exactly. that was causing yeah. trouble. Well, listen, I, I, I want to thank you, Pepper, and I want to thank you, Ginny, for coming on and talking about this. Uh, not just because I personally have wanted to bring it up for a long time and have a real deep discussion about it, but because it helps us write kind of a, a, an epic oversight Uh, that we haven't talked about this yet. Uh, And I just want to thank you both for coming on. If you have anything in particular you want to uh, promote or talk about anything that you're doing right now, um, you know, tell us so we can kind of let everybody know. Thank you. Um, I, um, my Twitter is uh, at Liralyn, as you said, and uh, I write for everyday feminism um, pretty regularly. And I also have my own blog, which is the brunettes blog dot wordpress.com. Um, and those are my writing and education projects currently. Okay. I'm, I'm a pretty frequent reader of Everyday Feminism. Uh, I think that's the first place I heard about you. So, uh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and how about you, Pepper? Even though I know what you, I, I know part of what you have going on, but why, why don't you tell me what you've got going on? Because I bet I don't know everything about you. Well, you know, I'm a parent these days, so I have a lot less going on than I used to. <laughs> um, but uh, you can find me on Twitter at FreakSexual. And uh, you can read some of my writings that perhaps haven't been updated in a while at freaksexual.com. And let's just leave it at that. And listeners, you know that you can always find us at facebook.com slash the swing set. You can check out this podcast, daily blogs, articles, and toy reviews on our website at lifeontheswingset.com and on our site's Twitter feed at on the swing set. You can send us email at contact at lifeontheswingset.com and give us a call at 573-55-SWING. That's 573-557-9464. If you have an episode idea for us, please share. Email episodes at lifeontheswingset.com with episode idea in the subject line because Cooper will see it. Don't forget to buy your condoms from the lucky blog at swingsetcondoms.com. And you can find our other great podcasts like The Gentle Pervert Social Club, Intellectual Foreplay, The Don't Panic Podcast, Sex at a Go-Go, and Tell Me Something Good at swingset.fm. And finally, you can buy Cooper's novel about swinging, A Life Less Monogamous, at alifelessmonogamous.com, or his memoir, My Life on the Swing Set, Adventures in Swinging and Polyamory, at mylifeontheswingset.com. And both are available as ebooks, paperback, or as audiobook. And if you buy them from his site, use the promo code SWINGSET to save 10%. Thank you for coming on, everybody. Even you, Cooper. Thank you, too. <laughs> Even Thank you. Me. Even you. <laughs> me. 
and listeners, thanks for swinging by. Hi, this is Princess Callie, author of Enough to Make You Blush and founder of kinkacademy.com. You're listening to a Swing Set podcast at swingset.fm. Have a sexy business? Love the Swing Set? Let's put these two great things together. The Swing Set Network has advertising and sponsorship packages available for our websites and podcasts. Email